Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Samit Basaria. I'm the head of the Constitution Making Program at International IDEA. Um, we're happy to host this event on the basic structure doctrine and the implications of the Kenya judgment for constitution making together with the Africa Network of Constitutional Lawyers. Um, I will introduce the panel and then we'll get started. But before I do that, um, I would like to hand over to Yvonne Oyeke, our partner uh, at the African Network of Constitutional Law uh, Lawyers, uh, for some words of introduction. Yvonne, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you to International Idea for reaching out to us to organize this very timely discussion. As mentioned, I'm Yvonne Oyeke, Deputy Secretary General of the African Network of Constitutional Lawyers, here to welcome you all to this timely discussion. Uh, I'm sure all of you, most of you are familiar with the African Network of Constitutional Lawyers, but we are a regional association that brings together a variety of people and institutions that are interested in constitutional law and the development of constitutionalism in Africa. And we aim to do a series of things, including offering a space for exchange of information and ideas between members of the network and between the network and other organizations, and also develop a constitutional and democratic conscience on the continent. Uh, and we do this through a series of partnerships and a series of activities and interventions and collaborations, including with International IDEA, the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung Foundation, the faculties of law at the University of Stellenbosch, Cape Town, Botswana, Nairobi, and now Namibia. And in a series of way, including conferences, uh, the most recent one being the virtual one that we held with the University of Nairobi and the upcoming one this year with the University of Namibia in Bintuk. We also do this through a series of regional and consultative meetings on various thematic areas and webinars such as the one we have today. So the panel today is very robust and the discussion very timely, hot off the heels of the handing down of the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment on the Building Bridges Initiative. Uh, this discussion also follows up on some of the themes and ideas that came out of the conference that we recently held with the University of Nairobi. And ultimately, we're interested to see what the lessons are that can be learned from this experience regionally and internationally. So I would just like to thank once again, International IDEA for their continued support and collaboration with the African Network. I'd also like to thank our esteemed panelists and speakers. I'm sure that you have a lot on your plates and the fact that you took the time to share your knowledge and your insights with us for this discussion is not taken for granted and we appreciate you and we thank you. And we also thank everyone who's joined in today to listen and contribute to this uh, conversation. So I look forward to a very interesting discussion. I thank you and welcome. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, so we have perhaps a, a uniquely qualified panel today. We're very excited about that. Um, three of our speakers were invited by the Supreme Court to uh, submit amicus briefs, and the fourth speaker was involved in the drafting of the Kenyan constitution. So lots of um, important and insightful uh, presentations ahead. I will introduce each speaker in turn. Um, for those who follow law in Kenya, um, Professor Migai Akech needs no introduction, but we'll say some brief words. Um, Professor Akech is perhaps Kenya's leading administrative uh, law scholar and has published practice and consulted extensively in this area of law. He teaches at the University of Nairobi's Law School, um, but has also conducted uh, extensive work in the policy field, both within Kenya where he drafted important guidelines for the judiciary and the office of the public prosecutor, but also at the regional level where he led the development of the inaugural Africa governance report, which is the African Union's uh, policy publication on the state of governance in Africa. So Professor Akech is gonna be speaking about the Supreme Court decision and the basic structure doctrine. Uh, Prof, over to you. You have 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Summit. I didn't know that I was going fast, but anyway, let me um, uh, try to confine myself to the 15 minutes. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, participate uh, in this uh, very timely 
forum. And um, we are doing so, just having received a summary of the decision of the Supreme Court, we await the, 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 the full decision tomorrow. So my remarks are going to be based on um, the, the work that I had done as, as amicus in, in, in um, my, uh, duty, let me say, um, to try and help the court to get the history right. Because when I read um, the decision of the, of the high court, I was alarmed, I was, I was incredibly alarmed that they had gotten the history wrong. And um, so I submitted uh, when, when, when um, the Attorney General appealed the decision of the of the High Court to the Court of Appeal. I submitted an amicus brief to the uh, Court of Appeal. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeal made absolutely zero reference to uh, my my amicus brief. I think the only judge that made any reference to that brief was uh, Justice Fatuma Sichale, um, and unfortunately, she was in the minority in in, in that decision that again affirmed the decision of the, of the High Court. So I figured uh, because the history for me is important and, and the applicability of the basic structure doctrine turned on the history, and I'll, 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 I'll say why shortly, because the applicability of the, of the, of the um, doctrine also claimed the High Court turned on the history of uh, the making of the Constitution of Kenya of 2010, it was important that we get the history right. So again, I submitted this brief to the uh, um, Supreme Court, and I'm delighted that the uh, judges of the Supreme Court uh, agree with me. And as I was telling my colleagues uh, in the panel just before we started this session, if you read the history right, I think you could only come to one conclusion regarding the applicability of the, of the basic structure doctrine in Kenya. So let me explain. If you look at um, the decision of uh, the, the High Court, they said that um, the basic structure was applicable to Kenya and that it protected certain fundamental aspects of the constitution from amendment through the use of the amendment power. Uh, they also decided that the exercise of the people's primary constituent power entailed four mandatory procedures, four mandatory and sequential procedures, namely civic education, public participation and collation uh, uh, of views, a constituent assembly debate, and a referendum. And in terms of uh, interpretation in making those determinations, they, state, they stated that they would be guided by a number of uh, principles of interpretation that you find in the constitution of, of, of Kenya. Uh, number one, the nature of the constitution. Number two, the history of the making of the constitution. Um, and, and, and so saying that the, the, the amendment powers should be interpreted given its nature and the history of its making. And so critically, the historical context, and to quote the court was, quote, imperative for giving proper meaning, unquote, to the text of the constitution. So from that perspective, therefore, the applicability of the basic structure doctrine in Kenya from the, the high court's perspective turned on the nature of the constitution and in particular the history of its of its of its making um so unfortunately that history or or the 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 high court's reading of the history was faulty for a number of reasons and unfortunately the court of appeal reproduced the same the, the, the same mistakes of of the court of appeal so number one The reading of the history by both courts was selective and contained all manner of errors, and I'll explain. Number one, it failed, both courts failed to recognize that Kenyans intended to make the procedure for amending the entrenched provisions 
in, in contained in chapter 16 now that Kenyans intended to make those uh, provisions more exacting, but nonetheless possible. So Kenyans were very clear that we don't want a hyper rigid constitution, but we don't want a hyper flexible constitution coming from a history in which it was always very easy to amend the constitution and with dire consequences. And so the mistake that both courts made is failing to appreciate that the people never intended to make any of the, 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 uh, the provisions of the constitution practically unamendable. And that is what both courts did when they insisted on those a historical um, uh, form under the anti-commercial pages. In fact, if you look at uh, the 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 decisions of both courts, what they did was then introduce procedures for constitutional, constitutional change that were greatly at variance with the provisions of chapter 16, but also greatly at variance with the history of the making of the constitution of, of, of uh, 2010. And so those four mandatory and sequential procedures are a historical. You don't find them anywhere in the constitution. Again, they also ignored that the constitutional review process that was conducted under the auspices of uh, the uh, Constitutional Review Act of 2008. So there were two, there were two processes uh, uh, for those that are not aware. There was a process that was initiated by a Constitutional Review Act of, of 2000, uh, 1997. That process uh, came a cropper in 2005 when the people rejected the, the so-called WACO draft constitution in 2005, WACO because it was, it was named after the then attorney general. So that failed when the people rejected it at a referendum. And, and we can explain, we can explore uh, during plenary why, why that failed. Come 2007, Kenya has the post-election violence and then it is decided let's have a constitution Act of 2008 to revive the constitutional um, review process. And so this second process, this second phase produces a draft constitution, and which is what went to the people in the referendum in 2010. This is the so-called revised harmonized draft constitution. So the fact what, what the courts, uh, the, the, the two courts, the High Court and the Court of Appeal did, which was wrong, was to ignore the fact that the second review process under the auspices of the Second Review Act of 2008 produced a draft that differed in material respect, I would say fundamental respect from the BOMAS draft constitution. BOMAS had proposed a parliamentary system of government, for example. The revised harmonized draft now proposed a, a presidential system of government. And this is because in Naivasha, the, the town where the last meeting of the parliamentary of, of the, the constitutional review organs took place. In Aivasha in 2010, the parliamentary select committee changed the system of government from parliamentary to presidential. The courts ignored that. The courts also ignored the fact that although the people had ultimately proved the constitution of 2010 in a referendum, they did not deliberate on it in a constituent assembly. There was no constituent assembly in 2010. And so you ask, where do the courts get um, in their four sequential procedures, where do they get that requirement of the constituent assembly? Finally, also, they also fail to recognize a very critical fact. And, and from, from my perspective has implications for the applicability of the basic structure doctrine. They failed to recognize that the question of how a new constitution of Kenya would be amended was extensively deliberated upon. And it was resolved in phase one of the constitutional review process, the so-called BOMAS process. In fact, the question of how the constitution would be amended was never a, con a contention. If you look at all the drafts from the BOMAS draft in 2002 to the revised harmonized draft in 2020, they contained essentially the same provision on the amendment of, of, of the constitution. So chapter 16 remained the same across 
the various drafts. In, in some, it was um, it was chapter 19, but the provisions it remained uh, essentially um, the same. And so the problem then at the Court of Appeal is that it then endorses this very selective and erroneous version of the, of, of the history of the making of the constitution by the High Court and it fails to interrogate. And just to give you an example. So you get Kiage, uh, 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 Justice of Appeal saying, for example, that, oh, I do not consider it necessary to go uh, into a detailed uh, analysis of the history of the making of the Constitution of Quentin. But he contradicts himself when he says, oh, but any court interpreting the Constitution must perforce be allied to the historical background if it is to do justice to the text of the Constitution. But so significantly, Kiage and the other judges then do not set out the historical background that they are alluding to. And so when I went to uh, the Supreme Court, I thought, I mean, in, in submitting my amicus brief, I thought that it was vital that the Supreme Court carefully considers how the Constitution of Kenya 2010 was made, given that the history formed the primary basis for the determinations of both uh, superior courts on the applicability of the basic structure doctrine in Kenya and its implications for the amendments of uh, the Constitution of, of Kenya 2010. So they have mistakes that uh, both courts make. And some of it, uh, one of, one, a critical one relates to the role of the political elite, because we were told, told, told that uh, the constitution was made by a one the ordinary uh, person, that uh, it was not an elite constitution. But when you look at the organs of um, constitutional review in both phases of uh, the process, political elites played a very critical role. In fact, we could never have had a, a, a constitution if the political elites did not agree. In fact, the second phase of uh, the process was deliberately designed to facilitate political elite um, uh, compacts, it, having it having been recognized, recognized, rec recognized from um, the failures of the first phase that unless there was going to be a compromise among the political elites, we were never going to have a, a, a constitution. So again, the courts ignored the role of power dynamics or power relations in the making of, of uh, uh, constitutions. Something that um, I, I, I have an interesting quote from Elliot Balmer, who says that good constitutions reflect both a consensus among the political elites that have to work with them and the consent of the people who have to live with them. So in, in other words, in, in any uh, good constitution making process, you must have um, a compromise between uh, uh, elite compacts and uh, popular sovereignty. Again, the court, the, both courts, especially the court of appeal, denigrates the fundamental um, importance of the referendum as a down uh, uh, constraint, um, constraint in on on the political elite. In fact, I, I I dared say that had this process, this process, the BBI, the the Building Bridges Initiative Amendment process, had it gone through to the referendum, there was a very high possibility that the people could have rejected it. So why why do the courts want to um, stop the people from exercising their sovereignty? so that they give their determination whether or not they agree with um, the political pact in, in the form of the BBI amendment bill. How much time do I have? You got about five more minutes. All right, so that was one. And then if you look at, uh, in terms of the procedures. So if, if you ask again, about I am faulting for sequential procedures. So if you look at the procedures, the question one might ask is, in any constitution making process, do you really need both a constituent assembly and a referendum? And from my reading of the literature, I find that the question of whether you need both 
is contested among constitutional theorists. And so from that perspective, my conclusion is that uh, you will find examples. So I'll, I'll give you examples in South Africa, in Uganda, in Tunisia, what you had were directly elected constituent assemblies being tasked with adopting the final uh, constitutional text. And, and uh, in, in those cases, a referendum was only included as an option of last resort in case the assemblies failed to adopt the texts by the required uh, majority. My point being that um, it is the people who should determine how they wish to exercise their constituent power. It is not for the courts to tell them uh, how they should exercise that power. And so it was wrong for both the High Court and the Court of Appeal um, to do that. Let me stop there. I think I've, I've highlighted uh, the major aspects for me that, that of, of uh, the High Court and the Court of Appeal that I thought uh, it was vital that the Supreme Court pronounces itself on, and I'm glad that the Supreme Court did. Thanks, Prof, uh, and, and excellent timekeeping, and uh, certainly did highlight some of the historical realities about how the 2010 Constitution came about, and also the debates, both political and social, um, that led to, to the draft and to the amendment provisions that we find in Chapter 16. Um, next, it will be Professor Charles Fombad, whom uh, I think everyone attending would be familiar with as one of the most prolific scholars on constitutionalism and comparative constitutionalism in Africa. Uh, he is professor of comparative constitutional law and director of the Institute for International and Comparative Law in Africa at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He's written and edited more than a dozen books and over 150 articles and book chapters on constitutionalism in Africa. He sits in numerous uh, editorial boards of prominent journals and is also the organizer of the Stellenbosch annual seminars on constitutionalism in Africa. Um, and as we mentioned at the outset, he was amicus at both the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court during the BBI proceedings and has published extensively on endurance and change in constitutional law in Africa. Uh, Professor Fombad will be speaking about judicial review of constitutional amendments in Africa, sort of taking us out of the direct uh, Kenyan context and providing some regional reflections. Professor, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this important uh, discussion. Yes, as you pointed out, I'll be talking about judicial review of constitutional amendments in Africa, generally. Let me start by saying that um, there were two critical aspects of modern constitutionalism that African constitutional designers try to deal with in the post-1990 revised or new constitutions. One of these was the entrenchment of provisions designed to ensure that judicial review of constitutionality of laws takes place. And the other were provisions also designed to control the amendments of constitutions. Whilst the judicial review of constitutionality was designed to ensure that violations of the constitution are promptly sanctioned. Control of constitutional amendments aims to ensure that these constitutions, unlike those in the past, are not vulnerable to frequent casual and arbitrary amendments by opportunistic politicians. The Kenyan BBI case reminds us, if we need any reminder, that the problem of frequent abusive and arbitrary changes of constitutions in Africa has not gone away. The case also tells us what role the courts can play to curb this. Can all our African constitutional courts intervene in the manner that the Supreme Court and the courts in Kenya did? The, the main question that I want to briefly address in my short presentation is to examine the extent to which African constitutional courts, would courts having constitutional review powers, 
are able to control and check against abusive amendments of constitutions on the continent today. And to be more precise, how effective is this legal framework for judicial control and review of constitutional amendments under modern African constitutions? To respond to this question, I'll focus on three main enabling or dis disabling factors. The first one is the model of the constitution. The second, the powers given to the constitutional courts. And the third, I'll look at some of the constraints within which these courts operate. And I'll end with some concluding remarks. So let me start with the issue of the model of constitutional review adopted. By way of background, one can say that at independence, most African countries adopted the constitutional review mechanisms that were being used or were imposed by the former colonial powers, often with some minor adjustments. For example, the British had formally adjusted the Marbury principle to the realities of the written constitution and incorporated this into the constitutions they designed for their former colonies in Africa. Modern African constitution designers had three main models to choose from. The decentralized, the centralized, and the hybrid or mixed model. A 2014 study that examined the post-1990 revised the new constitutions of 54 countries in Africa, and here I exclude the Sahara Arab Democratic Republic, showed that 36 of these constitutions, that is 66.6% 6 of them, had adopted the centralized model. 15 of them, or 27.7%, the decentralized model. And only one, Ethiopia, the mixed or hybrid model. Although the general trend then appeared to suggest that most countries had designed systems of judicial review very much along the lines of what they inherited at independence, there were a number of exceptions. For example, whilst all African countries with a civilian legal tradition had adopted the centralized model, not all Anglophone African countries adopted the decentralized model. In fact, four of these countries, Sierra Leone, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Zambia, had adopted the centralized model. There have been some significant changes since 2014 when this study was carried out. For example, the Chadian constitution of 2018 has now adopted the decentralized model and allows individuals to approach the Supreme Court that deals with constitutional matters. Although all the models have their advantages and disadvantages, and time does not allow me to go into the details of this, it will suffice to point out that the decentralized model on balance provides a more effective means for checking against abusive constitutional amendments. Now, let me go to the second issue, that is the powers given to these constitutional courts. The ability of constitutional courts to check against arbitrary constitutional changes depends on whether such powers have been conferred on them explicitly or implicitly. An examination of the scope of the jurisdiction of modern African constitutional courts clearly brings out the differences between those operating within a centralized system and those operating within a decentralized system. For analytical purposes, a distinction could be made between the scope of grant of primary jurisdiction and that of grant of ancillary jurisdiction. Primary jurisdiction here refers to the powers that a constitutional court is typically created to exercise. This usually comprises three main powers. Firstly, the power of constitutional review in a very narrow sense, which refers to the formal powers which a court has to strike down any piece of legislation or administrative action for violating the constitution. Secondly, the power to safeguard human rights and thirdly, the power to resolve conflicts of competence between central and local government and between government agencies intercept. Generally, the primary jurisdiction conferred on constitutional courts 
in the decentralized systems of Anglophone Africa is based on a combination of three main factors. Firstly, it can be said that the common law courts have historically asserted the power of judicial review as an inherent incidence of the general process of adjudication. Secondly, a power of judicial review may be inferred from the general provisions in the constitution of Anglophone countries, which vest judicial powers in the courts. And thirdly, and comprising perhaps the strongest basis for judicial review in Anglophone constitutions is the supremacy provision, which states expressly or implicitly that the constitution is the supreme law of the land and any law or action inconsistent with it is to the extent of the inconsistency invalid. What I therefore want to make clear from these three points is that the power of review of constitutional amendments is an inherent judicial power in the common law system of Anglophone Africa, unless where the constitution clearly limits this. By contrast, although centralized courts are created exclusively to deal with constitutional matters, the exact scope of their jurisdiction depends on the powers expressly or implicitly conferred on them by the constitution. The principle of constitutional supremacy does not carry the same weight and impact in centralized systems as it does within decentralized systems. When the powers of the courts provided for under the 36 African constitutions, which had adopted the centralized model in 2014 were examined, the differences between not only the centralized and decentralized model, but also between the progressive and conservative approaches within the centralized model become very glaring. For example, under the Benin Constitution, the Constitutional Court has been given the express powers to exercise all three primary jurisdictional functions, namely a review of constitutionality, safeguarding of human rights, and dealing with disputes concerning conflicts of competence. At the other end is Cameroon's Constitutional Council, which is conferred only very limited powers of constitutional review. Aside from the primary powers, the approach with respect to ancillary powers also differs from the decentralized and centralized systems in Africa. Ancillary powers refers to those powers that fall outside the prototypical constitution review function. Unless the contrary is expressly or implicitly stated, the Anglophone countries' constitutional courts are able to exercise many of the powers which could be assumed to be ancillary powers. In the civilian jurisdictions, where the civilian system has been adopted, a defined list of ancillary powers or functions is usually conferred on the constitutional court. This ranges from supervising elections and referenda to the regulation of political parties, the review of treaties, and so on and so forth. These ancillary powers vary considerably, not only in the extent to which they may require the constitutional court to refer to the constitutional text, if at all, but also in the degree to which they place these courts in the thick of potentially serious political controversies. On the whole, unlike in the common law jurisdiction where the constitutional courts operate within a decentralized system and have, as I pointed out earlier, inherent powers to review the nature of constitutional amendments, the powers of constitutional courts operating within the centralized system are usually limited only to those matters expressly specified in the constitution. These powers do not necessarily always include the mandate to review the exercise of constitutional amendment powers. Or in some cases, this is only vaguely alluded to. For example, Article 95 of the 2016 Constitution of Central African Republic gives the constitutional power, the constitutional court powers to only, and I quote, give an opinion concerning bills or proposals of constitutional revision and procedure of referendum, end of quote. Let me now come to some of the constraints within which the constitutional courts operate today. Although in the last three decades, 
the quality of constitutional justice has improved considerably due to the enhanced power of judicial review. The problem of arbitrary constitutional changes remains acute. This is largely due to the fact that the factors that have combined to undermine constitutional justice in the past have not entirely disappeared. As a result, there are numerous constraints that prevent the constitutional courts in many countries from intervening as decisively as the courts did, the Kenyan courts did in the BBI case. I'll just mention a few of these constraints. Firstly, the power to undertake such reviews by constitutional courts operating within the centralized system, as I pointed out earlier, is often very limited. At some point, the expanded powers given to the Benin Constitutional Court and the manner in which they exercise it have led some of us to suggest that we may be getting to a point where the question of constitutional justice today was less about what model is in operation and more about what powers the court has been given and whether it can fully utilize them to provide constitutional justice and protect citizens against arbitrary government. In the last four years, the congenital defects of the centralized model have surfaced in the Benin Constitutional Court to explore this myth. This is in spite of the fact that the Benin Constitutional Court, unlike that in many civilian jurisdictions in Africa, allows ordinary citizens to petition it and furthermore carries out both abstract and concrete review of constitutionality. Secondly, African judiciaries were at their most vulnerable before the 1990s, when they came under the tight control of the post-independence authoritarian regimes and could hardly act independently. In spite of the recent reforms, political control of judicial appointment processes by presidents whose authoritarian inclinations are becoming ever more apparent is still a future particularly in civilian jurisdictions. As a result, the judiciary in these jurisdictions have remained as docile as they were before the 1990 reforms. The situation in most Anglophone countries is only slightly better because judicial appointments in most cases are based on recommendations made by a reasonably independent judicial service commission. By contrast, in some civilian jurisdictions, the President of the Republic and his Minister of Justice still act as the chair and the deputy chair, respectively, of the appointment body, the Supreme Council of Magistracy, which is convened and its agenda is set by the President. And this body, believe it or not, only expresses an opinion or makes recommendations to the President himself. Well, you can judge for yourself whether a judge appointed under such circumstances can act independently. Thirdly, even in countries reasonably independent constitutional courts, because of the many divisive and politically sensitive cases coming before these courts and the growing tendency of the judges to assert their independence, the judiciary increasingly finds itself on a collision course with the executive branch. This happened to the judges of the Kenyan Supreme Court after a September 2017 presidential election judgment. Even in South Africa, the judiciary is under attack and sometimes referred to as counter-revolutionaries by some members of the ruling party. Executive fight back to intimidate judges remains a potent threat, especially in the last few years during which the ugly head of authoritarianism is on the rise all over the continent. This is bound to have a negative impact on the ability of judges on the continent to act independently and impartially when dealing with disputes involving the amendment of the constitution. Fourthly, apart from attacks on the judiciary, there has also been more direct action to reverse changes designed to ensure that judicial appointments are based on competence, not external political considerations. For example, in Zimbabwe in 2017, the 2013 constitution was amended to give the president sole power to appoint the chief justice, his deputy, and the judge president of the high court with an obligation only to inform the Senate if he does not act in 
accordance with the recommendation of the JS. The judicial branch will remain vulnerable to manipulation as long as the executive are allowed to play a decisive role in appointing the judges. Finally, on balance, the overall structure of constitutional courts operating within the centralized system, especially where there has been little attempt by constitutional designers to borrow progressive ideas from other models, with perhaps the exception of Benin, and the fact that ordinary citizens have no local standard before these courts have limited their ability to check executive abuse of constitutional amendment powers. By way of conclusion, let me say that uh, constitutional courts can only go as far as the constitution allows them to go. In my humble opinion, and before I read the full judgment of the Kenyan Supreme Court, my impression is that the Supreme Court made this point absolutely clear. Good constitutional design will, however, not solve problems such as judicial timidity and deference or judicial conservatism. We live in an era of heightened rights consciousness and all judges must be conscious of this. Regrettably, there are still many countries, especially in Francophone Africa and other civil law jurisdictions that have adopted constitutional courts for their symbolic value only. These countries are firmly stuck in the murky middle ground between constitutional democracy and constitutional authoritarianism. This explains why in many of these countries, important constraints on the abuse of power, such as term limits provision, were easily repealed. And in some cases, with the complicity of the constitutional courts. Whether or not one agrees with the BBI Supreme Court judgment, one le key lesson for constitutionalism in Africa that one can draw from this case is that in spite of the limited jurisdictional mandate of many of our constitutional courts, a combination of judicial assertiveness and civil society vigilance can help to control and limit the endless propensity by our leaders to change constitutions for their selfish ends. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Prof, for that magisterial overview of, of judicial review in Africa, the different models, different factors that affect different rules of courts, and where all of this sits with regards to the protection of constitutional democracy or the progress of constitutional authoritarianism. I um, really found that excellent. Thanks so much. Next, uh, we come to Dr. Adam Abebe, who is uh, part of our own constitution building program at International Idea, um, and also part of the uh, African Network of Constitution Lawyers. So he's uh, vice president at the AMCL and, and uh, here as sort of double host today. Um, with us, he generates knowledge on comparative constitutionalism, uh, provides platforms for a dialogue, and has provided advice, uh, technical assistance to constitution making bodies and civil society in numerous African countries. He has published uh, in prominent academic journals on comparative constitutional practice and is a regular commentator on political transition in Africa in prominent global news media such as Al Jazeera and BBC. Um, as well as his role with the ANCL, Adam is on the advisory board of the International J Journal of Constitutional Law, ICON and extraordinary lecturer at the University of Pretoria, as well as fellow at Kabarak University. Um, his article uh, was cited by a judge in the Kenyan Court of Appeal, and he was invited as a neutral expert, as an amicus uh, curate uh, in several recent prominent court cases, including by the Ethiopian Council of Constitutional Inquiry, and of course, by the Kenyan Supreme Court on the BBI case. So Adam, over to you. Thank you very much, Samith, and, and thank you very much also for Professor Miguel Ketch and Professor Fombard for, for the background. Um, now, I'll try and build on what um, from Professor Fombard was trying to outline, which is that um, in, in a lot of Anglophone African countries in particular, um, while courts have uh, claimed the right to review constitutional amendments, uh, it is often implicit, right? So there's no provision in the constitutions uh, 
uh, particularly in Anglophone countries, that specifically empowers courts to review constitutional amendments. Um, and it's generally the same also in, 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 in Francophone African countries, uh, in the sense that with a few exceptions, the constitutions are not clear in terms of whether uh, the constitutional courts or the Supreme Courts, as the case may be, uh, can review constitutional amendments. Um, and as also Professor Fombard uh, indicated, what often that leads to is an assertion by the courts themselves uh, to review constitutional amendments, but often uh, mainly on procedural grounds, uh, essentially looking at whether the process outlined in the constitution uh, has, been, uh, has been followed. And there are exceptions. Uh, but overall, you know, the, the first key observation is that uh, constitutions in Africa across, across the linguistic divide, across the, the, the geographic divide, do not specifically regulate um, uh, how and whether constitutional courts or the Supreme Courts, as the case may be, can review constitutional amendments. Uh, and now this sits with, and, and this is important to my uh, key commentary today, uh, this sits with uh, a reality where uh, the African court in particular, uh, but, but the African commission, but also the African uh, committee on the rights and welfare of, uh, of, of the child have actually claimed the authority, the mandate to review uh, not just the, the process. And in fact, they don't look at the process uh, 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 as outlined in the specific constitution, um, more, more in, in terms of the substance uh, and, and generally in terms of compliance with the requirements that exist at the African, uh, African level. Um, I'll, I'll give two quick, uh, two quick examples to exemplify this. Uh, but the, the, the key point is that at the national level, constitutions do not specifically empower uh, their highest courts to review constitutional amendments, certainly not on the substance of them. Um, but at the African level, at the continental level, uh, we have institutions that have claimed uh, the, the authority to review anything at the national level, including constitutional provisions uh, to enforce the, the standards set at the African level. Um, and to give two quick um, examples, one on substance, um, Tanzania, in, in Tanzania, uh, there was a, um, a candidate called Mitikila. He consistently tried to run as an independent candidate in presidential elections, uh, but he was refused um, because the electoral law banned independent candidates. Um, and when he went to court and challenged it in the high courts, uh, the high courts actually invalidated that provision and allowed him to run as an independent candidate. Um, nevertheless, the government appealed that decision to the Supreme Court. And while the, while the Supreme Court was actually looking at the case, uh, the government amended the constitution and included the ban on independent candidates in the constitution itself. Um, and he still went on and, and challenged that amendment in the high court, which agreed with him. Uh, but when he went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, um, the, the, as a court, it did not have the authority to review the substance of constitutional amendments. So it can review how the constitution was, the amendment was enacted. And if there were uh, uh, incompatibilities, it could invalidate it, but on, on substance, it would not do it. Um, but Mitikila was, it was a, persistent, um, a persistent man and he went to the African court uh, and in the end, uh, he got a decision from the African court, uh, which found that the constitutional uh, amendment, uh, despite the fact that it's part of the constitution of Tanzania, uh, it was invalid uh, because it contravened the right to association, which according to the African court, in court includes the right not to associate and, and, and the forcing of individuals to associate themselves with political parties to run for elections was therefore found to be incompatible uh, with the African, uh, with the African uh, uh, Charter. So you can see that you have a domestic court which could not review the substance of that uh, amendment because it does not have the mandate, but you have an African court that claimed the mandate to review anything, whether it's laws, constitutional provisions, or government decisions. So this is the, you know, on, on, on a good example on, on substance. Uh, the second one is also very interesting, but it's on process. Um, one of the, the interesting aspects of the, uh, um, um, the Bill of Rights, if you will, uh, at the African level uh, is that it, it includes provisions that normally are found in, in constitutions, like principles of separation of powers, judicial independence, uh, and for our purposes, the, in particular, the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance specifically provides that amendments 
should be uh, accepted or adopted through uh, a process that ensures national consensus. And so the amendment process um, of constitutions should uh, comply with the principle of, of, of national consensus. Um, and there was an interesting case, uh, and, and Professor Fombart touched on it. Uh, Benin has been seen as the um, epitome of, of, of democratic governance, particularly in Francophone West Africa. Uh, but since the current president came to power in 2016, it has seen a, a steady decline uh, in the level of competitiveness of the democratic, uh, the democratic context, uh, but also in terms of the autonomy of, of, of the framework. Um, and, and one of the things uh, that, that happened um, was with that in, in, in the um, 2018, uh, just before the 2018 uh, legislative elections, uh, the government enacted certain changes to the, to the electoral law. Um, and, and, and political opposition political parties opposed that, that change um, because it restricted their, their operations and they then boycotted the elections, the legislative elections, which meant that the ruling party essentially won uh, all the seats. Um, and the government then used its dominance again to uh, not only change electoral law again, uh, but also the constitution that included two key changes. Um, the, the first one uh, was the, uh, bro the introduction of what is called a sponsorship system. Essentially, if you want to be a candidate, uh, you needed to be sponsored by members of parliament uh, and also mayors. Uh, and as I said, because the, the political parties had boycotted the elections before, there was no opposition in, 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 the, in, the, in the parliament. And so what this constitutional and legal amendment meant was that nobody could run against the president in the 2021 elections. Um, um, but to bypass this, this, this uh, fear, and, and partly because the Benin Constitutional Court itself had in the past said that uh, constitutional amendments should uh, be founded on, on, national, um, on national consensus, um, the government, because there was no opposition in, in parliament, organized what is called a national dialogue just before the amendments uh, were, were, were adopted. Uh, and in that national dialogue, there were certain general principles that came out of it. Um, but ultimately, the outcome of that dialogue was rejected by the key opposition. Um, but again, still, the government used that, uh, uh, the outcomes of national dialogue, as a foundation uh, for, for the change. Um, now, um, a gentleman who wanted to run as a candidate in, uh, in, uh, in, in the in 2021 elections um, challenged the, this, this amendment in the constitutional court. Uh, but one of the things that had happened actually was, was that the president had appointed new members to the constitutional court. Um, and the, because the terms of the, the constitutional court judges are limited, he had the chance to, um, to make new appointments. Um, and the president of the court happened to be the personal lawyer uh, of, uh, of the president because before he became president, and he was also uh, an attorney general. And so essentially the, the constitutional court was captured. Uh, by the time these constitutional amendments um, were challenged based on the principle of national consensus, which, as I said, is also the same principle found at the African level. Um, but to, to cut these, the things short, the, the um, constitutional court approved the amendments, but this person again went to the African court and challenged it, uh, and the African court said um, on the ground, and on, because of the fact that the parliament was fully fully controlled by the president's party, one. And secondly, even if there was a, a national dialogue of sorts, it was not inclusive, it was not participatory, uh, the amendment uh, was found to be unconstitutional. Um, and so, you know, um, in, in this particular case, the, court, the African court did not evaluate the substance of the amendment. It said procedurally, uh, it was not founded on national consensus, uh, and therefore it was not necessary to look at the substance because the amendment itself uh, is 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 um, uh, is unconstitutional on those grounds, and in fact, um, in my amicus argument, actually, I had suggested that the Kenyan courts should have done that, and then ultimately, if you can invalidate something based on procedural grounds, there was really no need uh, for for a court to look at the substance, and that's exactly what the African courts um, uh, did. Uh, but to just bring us back now um, to 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 the, the the team that I'm covering. Um, obviously, I've given examples from the African court itself, but if you look at the African uh, Commission on Human and People, People's Rights, but also the Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, they all have claimed the mandate to review constitutional amendments. And I'll end where I started, which is that uh, we have um, African constitutions uh, 
that do not empower their courts to review constitutional amendments, but at the African level, uh, they can be reviewed. And so, uh, and so there is that, that, that incompatibility of sorts. And I think this kind of builds up to what uh, the next speaker will talk about in terms of what, uh, one, the fact that courts uh, at the domestic level, uh, you know, despite the fact that there are no specific empowerments, courts themselves are claiming this power. And secondly, particularly at the African uh, level, there is now uh, a new jurisprudence and what should, and, uh, should, that, what should that mean uh, to constitution makers? Uh, I'll end that. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, our last speaker is Professor Christina Mari. Uh, professor Mari is Emeritus Professor of Human Rights and Constitutional Law at the University of Cape Town and a member of the standby team of senior mediation advisors at the United Nations. In addition to advising on numerous constitution making processes, uh, Professor Murray has what I think is the unique distinction of having sat on constitution making bodies in three different countries. Uh, Professor Murray was on the panel of experts advising the Constitutional Assembly of South Africa in 1994 to 1996, sat on the Constitutional Commission in Fiji in 2012, and uh, most relevant for our purposes was a member of the Committee of Experts on Constitutional Review that drafted the text that went to referendum in Kenya in 2010. Uh, Christina, you have 15 minutes. Thanks very much. And um, thanks for bringing me into this discussion. I am particularly pleased to see some old friends lurking in behind their names in the in the audience. Um, but Adam, I'm, I don't think I'm going to respond exactly to what you were talking about. Um, I suppose the focus of the discussion for understandable reasons is really um, the basic structures doc doctrine. We'll, should courts assume responsibility for um, determining what is untouchable in a constitution? But I want to pick up really to begin with, just a comment to begin with, exactly the point Adam has just made. It, it's really stunning to me that the all the Kenyan courts actually um, chose to dive into the substantive issue of the basic structure doctrine and so on. Um, when, in, particularly the Supreme Court, without having read the judgment, when in fact um, the matter seems to have been settled on procedural grounds. Um, and um, it makes me wonder whether the only um, ratio of the decision of the Supreme Court is in fact the statement about the unconstitutionality of the um, process. And this, and as I understand it from the media summary, that the um, amendment is unconstitutional because it was procedurally incorrect, the way in which it was adopted. I sort of the way I learned law, that makes all the rest obiter. <laughs> and then of course, and I think a second aspect of that actually also is that even if they decided the process was, um, was that it was, properly procedural, um, were any of the proposed amendments, amendments that would interfere with the basic structure of the constitution. And I, again, having not read the majority, the, the Supreme Court judgment, obviously, I'm really puzzled about that. Um, possibly the shift to a presidential, to, well, the alleged shift from a presidential system could be considered to be something about basic structure. Um, firstly, it wasn't very much of a shift in my reading, but there are other countries, I think, and Portugal may be one in which much more fundamental shifts in the nature of the structure of the government have been undertaken without anyone suggesting this is a element of basic structure. Um, one can look at the way the Indian courts have treated basic structure. Sometimes they've had very sort of niggling things about it, but um, so sort of two sort of preliminary comments. You know, why did the court decide to do this? Um, I agree with Charles that courts should be bold and fearless, but I don't think they should be reckless. And I think it's very wise to keep one's tinder dry. I do understand that this judgment, um, perhaps deliberately, gives something to all sides, um, but um, I would. I would, I suppose, 
hope that courts generally are just a little bit more cautious and perhaps leave some battles to be fought some other day. Anyhow, that's a little bit of a, a background. Um, a bit more background is um, something I think everyone who's ever heard me speak knows I always say, that is that I've been asked to speak about how this might impinge on the way in which one designs amendment provisions. Um, and of course, generally speaking, there's really very little space for innovative constitutional design in constitution making. Um, it, sometimes things are a little bit out of the spotlight, out of the limelight, and there's a space for some more imaginative um, treatment. But by and large, constitution makers, I think, have rather little space in which to maneuver. So more background. Right, when one gets to designing amendment procedures, as um, the guy mentioned at the very beginning, the first question and the dominating question, in my experience at least, is always um, how difficult amendments should be, how rigid should the constitution be, um, how much flexibility is needed. Um, and that, as Magai pointed out, was an element that concerned Kenyans when they were asked those questions in 2001 and 2002. Um, and I think quite interestingly, there are often a lot of people who want the constitution a new constitution to be quite rigid for all kinds of reasons everyone will understand. There's a little bit of addition there, probably that the vanity of the drafters presses to or pushes towards rigidity. You want other people to come in and change the brilliant things you've done. Um, but of course, there are also usually people who are going to look for constitutions to be easier to change. And sometimes, I think particularly in post-conflict situations, um, those will be people who feel they've been forced to compromise on something and are hoping to walk away from those compromises as soon as possible. So lots of politics in the whole um, um, sort of decision-making process about how difficult it should be to um, amend a constitution. And also, of course, there will be often some sectors that want special protection. Um, and as I think was mentioned in sort of earlier judgments and in some of the amicus briefs, this tiered approach that we see in the Kenyan constitution and many new constitutions has helped a lot of people around those problems. I mean, the one thing that I think constitution makers are going to perhaps, the attention of constitution makers will have been drawn to by this whole series of judgments is the issue of how you get the public more involved. Um, I mean, it seems a good route to go to have more decision-making bodies in an amendment process. Um, and we see with the, the public initiative process in Kenya, um, you have the signatures. And I, I remain a little bit cynical about whether the signature route is a very sensible one, but seems too easy, too open to manipulation to be very wise. But there's the signatures, the evidence of people being involved. They're the county um, assemblies or county councils. Um, and then of course, the legislature and sometimes a referendum. So that's one way of having a sort of more diverse package. Another way I'm quite attracted to always is the requiring a gap between the, the first adoption of constitutional amendments requiring an election between the first adoption of constitutional amendments and the final a ratification of those amendments, because that process seems to me to bring um, the public and the politicians together um, in quite an intense way. And I know it's very Northern European, but it's something possibly worth thinking about. Anyhow, point there really is that I think this, this judgment is going to, or the series of judgments is going to draw attention to ways in which um, one might try and make constitutional amendment processes um, more inclusive of engaged public. Um, so first point. Second point, um, in one of his really interesting and I think sort of challenging um, blogs on the earlier cases, um, Professor Batia comments that the text didn't help answer a large number of the questions or a number of the questions that were before the court. So that made me think, well, could the text have been better? Were there ways in which the constitution could have been drafted to tighten up the text to make these questions easier to answer? I think my answer might be no, but um, 
just to draw out a couple of the questions that he in fact raises and that come up in the cases. One question that I think is really quite interesting is the question whether one should be allowed or one should try and um, restrain the possibility of a, of a referendum to approve constitutional change on a whole bundle of diverse um, issues. So, um, as you know, the proposal in um, Kenya would have been that the whole huge package of amendments ranging from small technical things, fixing problems in the constitution, right through to fairly major changes anticipating the forthcoming elections um, would just be presented to the public in one um, package. Um, and I think perhaps I would go for suggesting that um, issues need to be presented separately. Um, I'm aware that there are arguments that would suggest that you can't see a constitution as a sort of um, package of um, separate individual items, that every bit of a constitution interlocks with every other bit. To some extent that's true, although I think one could probably pull issues out of the Bill of Rights or out of independent institutions and so on that seem quite standalone. But the problem of sweetness and um, the ability of amendments to be manipulated to sort of pull people along is a real one. And the example that comes to my mind and someone should correct me if I've got this wrong, is the amendment that I think was in 2006 or three, four, five, six in Uganda, when Museveni granted people the right to have political parties, but in that package of amendments was also basically his right to remain president forever. Um, so he removed the term limits at the same time as um, including or permitting political parties and people stand through political parties for election. So there's a bit of a question, but as constitution designers, constitution drafters could clearly quite easily say that um, at a referendum, separate se issues must be separated at a referendum. I'm not pretending it will be easy. It's never easy to define an issue clearly. There will be overlaps and probably some haggling about what should go in which package at a referendum. But I think that might help. It would certainly force um, the electorate to think quite hard about things. Um, another textual thing. Um, could the constitution have clarified whether or not the president could actually use this popular route? Um, I suppose you could draft into a constitution that the popular initiative route cannot be initiated by or the promoters, to use the term referred to in the constitution, should not be people who hold political office or our state officials. Um, would that help? I think it's been pointed out somewhere or another, either in amicus briefs or in the judgments themselves, that of course it would be manipulated indeed. But a statement like that might signal at least to future decision makers, the kind of thing the constitution makers had in mind. So even if it wouldn't clearly um, eliminate the use of the popular process by political institutions or state institutions, it, it would describe what was intended a little bit more clearly. And then thirdly, and one that comes slightly closer to the issue of um, basic structure doctrine, um, should constitutions be more explicit or should Commonwealth constitutions be more explicit about whether amendment includes replacement. Um, I haven't done a proper survey of all of this, but I, I think that um, the constitutions in, in civil law countries quite often um, um, separate out the idea of amendment and the idea of replacement. Um, interestingly, I think, Kenya's um, independence constitution talks about alteration and um, defines alteration as including amendment, modification, and reenactment. Now, I don't know what reenactment means. Does it mean a new constitution or not? 
But really what that issue raises, what that question raises is, can the constitution itself be more clear on whether the power to amend includes the power to replace? Um, I think I've written somewhere and I now wish I hadn't, with some confidence that of course it amend includes replace. Um, and I certainly know that um, in South Africa and in Kenya in the past, and indeed even in Kenya now, perhaps it's assumed that you'd have continuity and the amending power could include a replacement, but maybe things would be clarified if the constitution set that out more clearly. Which brings me to the third issue. So the first was just that the big question is how rigid the constitution should be, and there are always many political interests there. The second is in what ways could you make a text more clear? Then the third, of course, must be this basic structured doctrine. And my first response, and I think I must have frustrated Adam in saying this to him, I said, what should I talk about? The basic structure doctrine is out of the hands of constitution makers. It's up to courts to sort of come in and say, well, constitution makers, you could do certain things. But in fact, once you've come up with a constitution, um, there are going to be parts of it that are unamendable. And you can't determine those parts. You can't tie the hands of future constitution makers. You can't tie the hands of the consti constituent power by saying, well, X is amendable um, when, in fact, possibly a court, a political body, might assume that it's an aspect of the basic structure of the constitution. I'm not sure how clearly I've managed to put that, but um, I think one of the conundrums with the basic structure doctrine for constitution drafters is that it depends on some kind of external assessment of what the basic structure is. Um, but then having thought that, I wondered, well, are there ways in which um, constitution makers might um, engage with the basic structure doctrine? I mean, obviously, as a number of people have already mentioned, when you include an eternity clause, when you include something that is unamendable in a constitution, you're signaling that some kind of new exercise of constituent power would be necessary to change it. In fact, you're signaling that you hope it will never change. So eternity clauses are, in a sense, a way of um, upfronting an aspect of the basic structure of a constitution. Um, possibly actually saying that you can replace a constitution, going back to the point I made earlier, spell out what you mean by amend and say expressly that you can, the amendment power, and the amendment process um, allows you also to replace the constitution, would signal that at least in this exercise of constituent power, the people um, want to permit all their decisions to be changed. And as I've already said, the concept of basic structure kind of possibly disallows that decision by current constitution makers. Um, possibly a constitution could set out a Thirdly, set out a process for its full replacement. And it might set out a process that is more alert to um, the exercise of constituent power. It might, as I'm like uh, Megai, I'm not convinced that the description of the process by the, the High Court was, was particularly accurate or particularly useful, but it may um, want a constituent assembly of some sort or a referendum and a constituent assembly. So maybe the constitution drafters can engage with the challenges of the basic structure doctrine by um, permitting the replacement of a constitution, complete revision of the constitution, but setting a special process that um, engages the constituent power. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of completely flummoxed by all of this. I must just sort of say two things. I, I mean, I'm fascinated in the literature by the, the 
the trust that people have, some people, not everybody, not a number of speakers today actually, have in the idea that there is a basic structure to a constitution and it shouldn't be, aspects of constitutions should be unamendable. And secondly, that the exercise of constituent power, and I think this is the other side of the coin, the exercise of the constituent power is a better way of changing these fundamental things. I think we've seen, for instance, in um, the Andes region, in Bolivia and Venezuela, if that's in the Andes, um, that um, the use of constituent power can be as manipulated as the use of existing political structures and so on, and the, the people under ordinary circumstances. And then an issue for certainly for South Africans, and I think for Kenyans, is this question of continuity. Now, I haven't had really thought enough about this, but why do we find constitutional continuity so important? Um, why did South Africa even agree that the white parliament should approve the new process for adopting our constitution? I mean, to me, that's really remarkable. You have a obviously illegitimate um, legislative body, but go with the idea that the new constitution making process should be approved without a legal break by that old body um, and then moving ahead. Um, so I suppose that slightly um, indecisive point to, to end on. Um, I suppose one last comment, perhaps also made by Maguire right at the beginning is, I also wonder how many Again, if, if um, the con exercise of constituent power is the other side of the basic structure doctrine, basic structure doctrine says you can't change things without an exercise of certain things, without an exercise of constituent power. How many constitutions do we know that actually have been adopted um, in a way that would sort of meet the expectations of the exercise of constituent power? Um, I suspect relatively few. But anyhow, thanks particularly to African Network and Idea for making me spend the weekend sort of trying to think about these things. And um, yeah, I look forward to your questions. Thanks, uh, Professor Murray. Thanks to all of our speakers um, uh, for excellent interventions. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. You can either put them in the chat um, or you can just raise your cyber hand in, um, in Zoom. Um, there is a question already in the chat for Professor Akech, but I think it's also worth uh, opening to the other panelists. And the question is from uh, Baluma Buire, and it is the following. Uh, Professor Akech, I'm not sure if you, you've seen this, but I'll, I'll read it out for all of the participants. Uh, so the question is, um, in the judgment, uh, Justice Wanjala opined that in the basic structure, ideology was yet to attain the status of a doctrine and is best and is at best a school of thought and therefore was not justiciable and courts could not be called upon to determine it. So what is Professor Akech's take on Justice Wanjala's holding vis-a-vis -vis the justici justiciability of the doctrine? So is the basic structure doctrine a doctrine at all? And should courts even be required in Kenya to um, uh, to consider it, Professor Akech? Thank thank you, Buluma, for the for for the questions. Um, let me answer. I haven't read the judgments, as I've said, so I'm, I'm, I'll be keenly looking to 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 read. Um, what uh, Justice Dr. Angela was meant by saying that uh, the, the basic structure doctrine is not really a doctrine. But let me look at it from, from, from my perspective. Uh, and from my perspective, I find on the useful side, if, if you're saying that you want to be able to protect um, a set of higher ideals or fundamental principles uh, in, in a constitution that courts should be able to do that, then that, that makes sense. However, how far should you go? Which is where I, th I think uh, the question of, of, of whether this is an established doctrine comes in. How, how far should you go? And, and for me, that, that is, that is uh, problematic at four levels. 
Number one, the, the danger with, with the doctrine as I see it is, is the danger that it can lead to the fossilization of institutions. Because if you take it to its logical con conclusion, it might lead to the freezing of uh, particular institutional designs in, in a constitutional system. And the result would be that past generations would, would rule present and, uh, and, and future generations from, uh, from the grave. And I want to link this to uh, what I, I thought uh, Christina was saying that, that that is important. Two things. One is uh, asking that question, uh, how, how rigid or flexible should a constitution be? And then she was saying that perhaps post-conflict constitutions should be easy to change. And, and, and one can read the constitution of Kenya 2010 in many res respects as a post-conflict constitution coming in the wake of um, the post-election violence of, of, of 207. Mm -hmm. And I say so because when you look at the compromises that were made, particularly with respect to the system of government, that all along, many, very many people wanted uh, a parliamentary system, mm -hmm. but ultimately the compromise was made that a very delicate compromise, a very last minute compromise that let us have a presidential uh, system of government. In that context, do you really want to tell the people that, look, you can never be able to change what you did not want in the first place? So you have a very delicate compromise. So from that perspective, therefore, I think that it, it, it is then harmful uh, to claim through the doctrine that certain institutional designs in a constitutional system, and by institutional designs, I mean, for example, I'm contrasting a parliamentary system of government with a, a, a presidential system of, of, of government. And again, link, linked to that, the mistake that the two courts made, particularly at the high court, was that it never engaged in uh, a granular analysis of the, the Building Bridge, Bridges Initiative Bill. It never told us that this provision of the bill violates this fundamental provision of the constitution. If you read uh, both the judgments, was nothing as, uh, of, of that nature, which then makes it very difficult to uh, uh, outline the precise scope of, uh, of, 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 uh, of the doctrine. So for me, from that perspective, then you, you have a, a, a doctrine that is very imprecise. And from the cases that I've read, including the Indian cases, the basic structure of any given constitution will be what the court says it is. And, and so you have a dilemma if you want to amend a constitution, should you then go to the court to ask in advance, well, is this one uh, okay? Does it, will, we, will this one meet with your approval or not? The other quarrel that, that, that uh, I, I, I have with it, is that constitutions are never nego ne never an, uh, made or negotiated in a context in which everyone has the same kind of uh, power. So in any constitution making process, there's never a level playing field. You must account for differentiations in, 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 in power at, 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 at among the people at the time of uh, a constitution of, of, of uh, of, I mean, at the time of constitution uh, making. And, and, and that is why we, we talk of the, the mythical uh, veil of ignorance, because you can only have true constitution making behind, occurring behind the mythical veil of, of uh, ignorance. But we never have that. And, and so precisely because you, there's never a, a level playing field, one must always contemplate that it should be possible to amend a constitution that you must get that uh, rigidity, um, uh, fl uh, flexibility, balance uh, right. And then for me, and, and I think what this probably what uh, uh, Justice Wanjala was alluding to, why should courts have that much power? Why shouldn't we leave, let the people decide what it is that, 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 that they want? Because the, 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 the risk, is that the doctrine uh, in court is, uh, I'm saying doctrine in courts, given what Justice Wanjala was saying, uh, 
is that it risks transforming the courts into policy makers. Because what essentially the courts are doing is um, they're opting among different policies by either approving or refusing an amendment to the, to the, to the constitution. That for me is very, is very problematic. Thank you. I hope I answered the question, Bulum. Thank you, Prof. Um, any other of our panelists want to weigh in on any reflections on Justice uh, Wanjula's comments that the basic structure doctrine is not a doctrine? Adam, go ahead. Th thank you. Um, well, I think so. so uh, Professor Akech has, has kind of covered most of the ground. Um, but I think one of the related aspects is, is, is also that, um, you know, the, the judge is trying to resist the call for importing something that has not concretized. Even if there is this binding idea of a precedent, um, what the judge is essentially saying is that this thing, um, the idea itself, has not achieved a level where it can be called an, an acceptable established um, uh, pre precedence. Um, but in any case, I think the, the, the key point uh, for me uh, that ultimately the judge in the Supreme Court made was, was that um, the, the, the four procedures that the, the Constitution, the High Court uh, uh, developed and the Court of Appeal approved um, essentially were not put together to measure vis-a-vis -vis the procedure that the constitution already outlined. So even if we agree with them, with the idea that there's a basic structure and that can only be changed through a particular process, um, I, I find it uh, unconvincing from the high courts and the court of appeals perspective that what they outlined can protect these, those basic structures more than what is provided for in the current Kenyan constitution. And in fact, um, if the uh, Indians, and I think, you know, Christina Murray talked about eternity clauses, um, but you can talk broadly about basic structure in the Indian context, and I'm not an expert, but I, 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 I assume that um, if there was a process in, in India that followed the process that the Kenyan constitution provides now uh, to change certain aspects of the Indian constitution, um, I would be very surprised if the courts would still invalidate something like that. As essentially, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, Indian constitution in terms of the basic, stru basic structure doctrine and other countries where they put eternity clauses, uh, often the, the a suggestion is that there has to be a, an inclusive participatory process, um, especially if that is not provided already in, in the constitution. And of course that creates vulnerabilities. And I think that's what we saw, for instance, uh, in Guinea, in Guinea, in Guinea, in Guinea Conakry, where um, the, the president essentially uh, tried to go around an unamendable provision that prevented him from running again and adopted a new constitution. And, and the process was not outlined. Uh, and effective, it was actually less strict than the amendment process that was provided in the constitution. Um, and so, you know, if we say that uh, a different process has to be followed uh, to amend unamendable provisions, it could be problematic. And I think that's where uh, Christina Murray's point about specifically regulating replacement uh, may also be uh, cr critical. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Christina? Um, well, well, just briefly first, um, Magai, I didn't actually say that you might want post-conflict constitutions to be easier to amend. Um, and it's quite an interesting question and I think quite a troubling one, actually. Um, because those are the very constitutions that people often rely on to secure uncertain futures. What I did say is there will often be people in those situations, uh, perhaps negotiating the constitution, who are quite cynical about it and who hope to be able to get out quickly, get out of whatever deals they've made. And so um, might push for an easy amendment process. But your point is, an equally interesting one. Um, and just quickly on the doctrine thing, um, I, I don't know how you define doctrine, so <laughs> I, mean, I agree with the guy and Adam, broadly speaking, but is the underlying issue not the idea that certain matters can only be changed by an exercise of constituent power? And if you accept that idea, which um, I, you know, the court, the Supreme Court didn't, um, and I think they're 
quite strong arguments, not to necessarily, especially in a common law tradition. Um, then the what is called the basic structure doctrine is an attempt to implement that. Um, so I suppose formally it's a doctrine, but it's just not a doctrine that is not necessarily acceptable. Um, and one quick thing on the replacement of constitutions, um, you know, can I, what about having a process for the full replacement of a constitution set out in a constitution? Now, again, that I suspect could be a really sensitive issue in a constitution drafting process. I can say with some certainty, not 100% obviously, that South Africans, the South African politicians who adopted our constitution would not have wanted a process about how that very constitution could be replaced incorporated in the constitution for a reason that Adam hinted at. You don't want to start, so you adopt a constitution and you don't want to immediately say, but it can be replaced. Um, and similarly, I think when you include eternity clauses in a constitution, you're not really also saying, but actually one day an exercise of constituent power can, can change that. Um, you are attempting to say something that is actually for eternity. Um, Thanks, Christina. Um, any more questions from the, the floor? I see Adam has a question in the text. If there's anyone else who would like to pose a question, you're welcome. Uh, I see uh, Henry Slechter has his hand up. Please, Henry. Um, I guess my question, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I, I can hear my you. My question is probably for Christina, given this, this is where her, her um, talk focused on. But I'm so, I sort of wondered when I heard that, is it, po the, it may seem like a very silly question, but is it possible for a constitution right to simply put it an absolute house to cause for any future constitutional amendment to say, under no circumstances may a court review anything other than I guess the form in which a constitutional amendment is adopted. Do you know of any country who's done that? None springs to mind for me. And do you think courts would take that seriously? Like, it, it, it seems like there's an option on the table here that, I, again, I, I, I can't think of any obvious reason why that would be completely unacceptable to courts. Thanks, Henry. Christina, could constitution makers limit courts to reviewing uh, amendments only on procedural basis? Well, I suppose constitution makers can do anything. Um, <laughs> would it would it work? I mean, I'm sort of. <clears throat> I suppose again, um, other speakers have said more about this um, already today than I have, and know more about it. But what really interests me a little bit is how, in Africa at least, um, possibly in other parts of the Commonwealth, the courts were unwilling even to. Um, um, assess procedural matters. I mean, they, you know, so the idea that Parliament can, um, or the Speaker can say, this followed the set procedure. Um, certainly, many um, Commonwealth African courts have said in such cases, we can't go there. Um, the legislature, we can't um, sort of second guess anything the legislature has said. So, you know, not so long ago, um, courts were prepared to be very um, uninvolved in any matter that was related to lawmaking. And so constitutional amendment doesn't really answer your questions, just sort of mulling over these things. Hey, Adam, um, so there's a question in the chat that um, you say is not from you, so it must be from someone else. Is that right? Yeah, I, I don't know how my name is on that because I didn't write it. Um, um, but maybe, I don't know if Pro Professor Fombard is still with us, um, but he, maybe he can he can answer. Uh, he, just to leave. he sent me a message. Okay. Um, well, I think so. In, in that case, I think um, in, the, in India, they tried to do that, right? After the courts uh, reviewed the amendments, they tried to actually exclude the courts, right? Uh, but of course, the court 
kept on doing what it did. Uh, another country is Turkey, I think, uh, kind of the same, the same process. The courts were reviewing amendments and then they specifically said, okay, you can review, but only on procedural grounds. Um, that's that's a response, and I think it has worked slightly better in Egypt, in, uh, in 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 Turkey than uh, in India in terms of actually constraining um, judges. But even in Turkey, they have you know found a way to engage in in, in substance. Um, even as they talk of uh, of the exclusion, even as they accept that they have been excluded, they always find a way to engage um, substantive substantive aspects. So Christina is right. Um, so it's always a battle. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it's it's interesting to see what other things can do, particularly in my opinion, in terms of saying, okay, you can't do it, but you need a, a like a, a two thirds majority or or something, right? Because the, the 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 trouble with silent, you know, remaining silent about it is that if they do claim the right to review, um, then they will be using the normal process. So a normal process they use to rule on basic things. They will be using the same thing to challenge something that has been gone that has gone through a higher consensus and even potentially referendum um, and so i think there is there are some things that can be done and particularly as i said if the international courts if the international judges that have you know that are quite distant uh, can, can do it um, and if states of course you know in both tanzania and and, and benin they have not uh, agreed you know they have not accepted the judgments, because uh, you know, amending a constitution requires process and all of that. Uh, but if in theory and in practice, if, they have, if the international courts have done it, uh, does it make sense for domestic constitution makers to remain silent about these things? Um, uh, and so, you know, th maybe there are some certain things that they they can do. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Uh, turning again to a question in the chat from uh, Yaya Balde. Um, I'm not sure, Yaya, if I if I understand completely the question here, but basically, it's can constitutional interpretation be entirely left with the courts, given its relevance to parliamentary divide takeover matters? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the second part of that, but uh, if you're here and your microphone's working, maybe you can clarify. Well, I mean, if we take that question with the other question that somehow came from Adam, but was from someone else, I think there's just sort of two general concerns that that this court case uh, raises. One is um, uh, how to structure an appropriate balance between rigidity and flexibility of constitutional amendment formulae, um, and uh, can constitutional interpretation be entirely left with the courts, or does this give the courts too much power? any of our panelists like to reflect on those two sort of fundamental questions? If, if I may, uh, Samit, uh, a, a number of things, but just, just uh, first of all, responding to uh, Christine on, on the Kenyan context. What I meant is that, um, look, to 2010, 2010, uh, 2010, we were coming out of, uh, a, a conflict uh, situation, the, the 207 208 post election violence. And, and, and so it was felt strongly that uh, the country needed to be stabilized. So if it meant getting a system of government that was nonetheless not really something that people uh, agreed on, we could, in the interim, have uh, that presidential system of government stabilize the country. Um, but it was never the intention that even if, if, you, if, if you speak to the politicians who were involved in the process at the time, they will tell you that we never thought at the time that we would subsequently be prevented or that it would never be possible to revisit that compromise. So what I'm trying to maintain is that um, the compromises on the system of government in the constitution of, of 2010 were shallow compromises. So, uh, hence my concern that really, should the people be stuck with what was a shallow compromise and what remains very contentious. The reason we ended up with BBI, the reason that we've, we've, we've had a, a contentious, a contentious elections in 2013, contentious presidential elections in 
in 2013 and 2017 are precisely because of the presidential system of government. It's being recognized now that we need a system of government that is include, inclusive. The presidential system of government is not it. And so it should be possible that obviously with uh, involving the exercise of, of, of the constituent power to amend the system of government, to change the system of government. But on, on um, the flexibility, rigidity, balance, my sense, let me give you context. There have been 21 attempts to amend the Kenyan constitution uh, of 2010, 21 attempts. None of them have succeeded. So then you ask the question, is this, are we dealing with a rigid or a flexible uh, uh, constitution? But so in, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of my answer to that, I see, see it um, displayed in, in the Kenyan constitution that we have, um, that it's difficult to amend. It's, it's difficult to amend because if you look at uh, chapter 16, it has uh, special procedures. So it, it, it requires uh, special majorities uh, in, in, in some cases. It requires the involvement of different institutions, whether it is the, 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 the county assemblies, um, the, 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 the legislature, the national level, both houses of the legislature. Um, in many ways, therefore, what you have in, 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 in our constitution as the Chief Justice was uh, stating in her judgment in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the BBA case, is that we have a tired amendment. Uh, uh, we have tired amendment procedures, which may have made it exceedingly difficult for, um, for the constitution to end it if, if the 21 attempts are, are, are anything uh, to go by. And then also when we say that um, only the, the people can use the popular initiative route, we are not considering the practicalities of that in the sense that successfully pushing through a constitutional amendment will require resources. It will require resources at the level of uh, mobilizing the people, at the level of uh, persuading citizens, at the level of uh, educating citizens on, um, on, on the amendment. It's going to be a very ex expensive exercise. And if you look at it from that perspective, you ask yourself, which one Jiko, or which citizen is this that has these resources to be able to push through a constitutional amendment? Or will the popular initiative be something that we only have on paper, but we will never realize in practice? I leave it at that. Thank you, Prof. Um, Adam, maybe you could pick up the thread and there's also a, a sort of query directed uh, for you in the chat. Um, well, so I think maybe a little bit about what I think that the final point that, uh, that Miguel made, um, there's actually a, a piece, maybe um, uh, I'll, I'll share it later, uh, by um, what is Tom, what's his name, um, the Kenyan, uh, he wrote an article when the first citizen initiative was started. Um, his fundamental point was, was, was really that it was supposed to enable the people and disable the elites. But in reality, uh, there, is, there was a massive risk that uh, it's actually giving elites an alternative, a second door, essentially. Um, and, and that's what the point that, uh, you know, me, me guys is, is, try, is trying to make. Uh, you, you can be clever when you design it, but it's, it's very difficult to, to evade the influence of elites, uh, whether politicians or, or other elites, uh, in terms of pushing reform, reform ideals, considering the resource and all it needs. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think especially the way the courts have now tried to refine it to constrain the, the political elites, there, there is always a chance um, that the people can use it to, to do cer certain things. Um, on the point about, uh, about from, from Denim, um, I can't really read the, the, from the, se the, second, the second name. Um, well, so you, you, you are right, I think, um, and, and it kind of builds up on, on what Christina said earlier. Um, you know, we can ar agree or ar arguably that there is a basic structure of a constitution. Uh, 
Um, and especially when there are clearly stated principles as in Kenya and in other places that are made uh, unamendable or as uh, eternity closes and all. Um, but my sense is, is that just because they are there, uh, it doesn't entitle courts um, to then try and in enforce them. Um, because it's, it's very, you know, constitutional amendments require very extensive, large scale consensus, uh, broad, uh, broad, prom you know, broad deals behind, behind the scenes and with the public and all of that. Um, and if we, in, you know, if courts can just claim that power, um, then, then as, 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 again, as, as I could say, uh, essentially we, you know, we can, it can arguably that judges should invalidate laws, you know, ordinary laws, but if we say they also should do constitutional amendments, uh, they, you know, we are leading to judicial supremacy rather than constitutional um, su su supremacy. So my argument is not that they shouldn't have these powers, but it should only emanate from express regulation. And that regulation, of course, could then mean that the process they follow, the number of judges that must agree, the time they should, you know, there's a lot of things uh, that regulation can do. Uh, and, and in that way, um, you know, we are not empowering them. We are actually constraining courts in, in, in that sense. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Christina, any reflections? Uh, well, sort of, yeah, hundreds of reflections, but I um, don't think you want to hear them all. Um, just to pick up on um, Magai's sort of first point, um, or most recent point. So let's assume we're all a bit uncomfortable with the presidential system. Um, I must admit I'm slightly cynical about the politicians who say, oh, but we didn't think this would be there forever. Um, yeah, they were almost certainly thinking of the next election, but really politicians engaged in constitution making need to assume they're doing something that is not just for the next term. So I'm a little bit um, unimpressed by um, politicians who kind of later say, well, we didn't really mean it to last. Um, but that does more seriously, that does take one to this question of the, the, the list of um, amendments that need to go to a referendum. Because I think you're, you're right in saying some things need to be changed more easily. I mean, what is very evident, as I think I said before, is it, it, in the bundle of changes in the BBI proposal are some that are really necessary and really very technical, just tidying up things that are messy and should be streamlined and so on. Those things should go through. That should be an easy process. A sort of related question, is the, the list of issues um, in, is it section 256 or seven, whichever, um, the list of issues that need to go to a referendum too um, expansive? Could it have been done another way? I, I don't know how other constitutions do these lists, but I mean, could you have tried to refer, for instance, to issues like accountability um, and rather than the whole of the system of government? So as to allow changes to sort of institutional arrangements, but to protect underlying principles and require a referendum for them. I mean, as I say it, I realize it would be really difficult and you know, the law is a blunt instrument and constitutions are blunt instruments. So possibly that would be asking too much and open up too much for, again, judicial determination. Um, the other thing that, as I said before, that this whole debate has made me think about is, you know, what was the role of the popular initi um, in initiative route in the constitutional proposals? I mean, it's, its genesis is obviously, or I assume, is in the incredible force of civil society in Kenya, particularly in the 1990s and in the early 2000s, where the, the role of people-driven constitution making was important. But actually, if you look at that process, the only serious thing it does about amendments is makes it easier to get amendments through parliament, right? Because it reduces the, um, parliamentary approval from two thirds to um, a, a, a majority. Um, so it's a process which allows you to avoid a minority of MPs blocking constitutional change. 
So if that's your goal, I suppose this is, you know, if I was thinking about this, redesigning this part of the constitution, um, are there other ways of doing that? Are there other ways of trying to avoid that parliamentary block? Or do we actually believe that the best we have in the representation of people is politicians? Um, you know, I am very aware that politicians, you know, it's sort of like the best of a bad bunch, but um, they do at least potentially represent people and nothing else does that. Is the other way to go to be a little bit more, more demanding of subnational units? It, I think it was rather a quick fix to have 50, half of the county councils um, do the job. Under the BOMAS draft, for instance, there were 70 subnational units, half of which had to approve an amendment going through this route. But that's just to say, all of this makes me wonder, are there other ways of managing this? Um, the one that another speaker referred to earlier that I think is not a good way is the Russian way of allowing the president to completely bypass the legislature and go straight to a referendum. I know that was proposed in Syria and some earlier constitution as well and so on. Um, so you don't want that kind of way of bypassing um, a legislature. But if it is strongly felt that a supermajority in a legislature shouldn't be the only way of changing the constitution. What other options are there? Um, and I think that's worth thinking about. Thanks, Christina. Um, and I think it's actually a really interesting point. And for me, you know, the, this decision as well as the 2016 process rather than the basic structure doctrine, to me, do raise a lot of questions about the place of citizen initiatives in constitutional change. Um, but there is one a specific question on the judgments. Um, so I shall ask uh, Professor Ketch again to come in on this one. And this question is from Camilla Knight, who says, and sort of touches on a point that Christina raised before regarding whether to have multiple questions or a single question in a referendum. So the question is as follows. Uh, the Kenyan Supreme Court avoided addressing the question whether there was need for multiple questions or a single omnibus referendum, yes or no question. Would this be a potential challenge in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Camilla, for the, for the question. Would it be a potential challenge? Uh, probably yes, but my my sense of it is 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 um, the following. I, I think it is it is sensible to avoid uh, multiple questions all altogether, and the reason I say so is if you have already designed a process for amending constitutions that is uh, deliberative, that is uh, participatory that is consultative, that involves uh, various institutions of the people, then the referendum is, I would imagine, um, either a vote of confidence on, on the process or not. And so if you look at it in from that perspective, then you're better off with a yes or no vote. Yes or no in the sense that uh, it is then a mechanism, a mechanism for the people to either approve the package or not. Because uh, again, as Christina was saying, you're dealing with uh, 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 a package, isolating particular issues to be able to say we, we voted for these, we didn't vote for the other. I think can be very complicated uh, in, in terms of uh, the practicality of it, but. Also, I don't think that that would be necessary. So for me, it is simply saying, how, do the people support these proposals or not? Through all these processes that 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 we have uh, uh, gone through, uh, there has been public participation. Uh, uh, there has been deliberation on these proposals by by the people. There have been compromises, give and take here and there. 
it, on the whole, then you're asking the people, given this context that you've compromised on some, you've not, you don't uh, like others. On the whole, do you think that this is something that you can live with? And I think that is what we did with um, uh, the constitution of 2010. We didn't ask the people, look, there are you voting? Uh, we want you to vote on contentious issues. No, we just want you to vote on the package. Do you like this as a package or you don't? Obviously, you, the, the, it's not going to be a situation where everybody agrees on every single provision of, 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 of the constitution, but given the, 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 the necessary compromises that are to be made, is this something that you can live with? So I, I, would, I would think that it is best to avoid multiple, multiple referendum questions, just for a yes or no, assuming, of course, that the process has been deliberative. Thanks, Professor. Um, that brings us to the end of our uh, time here. And I want to thank uh, all the panelists for their excellent interventions. And also thank our partners, the African Network of Constitutional Law. Um, it's always an honor and a pleasure to work with the ANCL. And thanks uh, very much to all the participants for your uh, attention and your participation. And look forward to seeing you all again in another forum sometime soon. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Have Thank a good you. day, everyone. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for future meetings, I hope. Looking forward to them. Thank you, Christina. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Bye. Take care, everyone.